all of us here today, we have two lives. There's the life on paper, the one capturing our accomplishments. Think of your resume or your CV. Then there's the life that we actually live. Often, these two lives don't reflect the same reality. I'm no exception to this. I've had a pretty successful career so far. Currently, I'm pursuing a PhD in computer science here at Stanford University. I have a National Science Foundation graduate research fellowship. I did my bachelor's and master's degrees at MIT. And I interned at Google twice, once in California and once in Switzerland. Looking at my life on paper, people often imagine it followed a linear path, a nice straight line like this. They probably assume that I started well off and came from a loving and supportive family, that I was enrolled in the best schools and pushed to take the toughest classes, and as a millennial, that I felt special. <laughs> But if you dig a little deeper, my life looked a little bit more like this. I was born while my mom was in prison. My father left before I was born. I still don't even know his name. I was put into foster care and then later adopted by my maternal grandparents. Although they had big hearts for volunteering to adopt me and my siblings, they didn't have much left to give us. So I grew up poor. Our primary source of income was my grandparents' social security. I spent K through 12 in public school And I was never in anything like a gifted and talented program. In fact, I started out in remedial English classes in elementary school, and I was average at math. So there's a gap between these two lines. And unfortunately, for people who start on these two trajectories to intersect is incredibly rare. That bothers me. And it's part of the reason that I'm pursuing my PhD. Regardless of the y-intercept, the limit should be the same as time goes to infinity. Today, I want to demystify my trajectory and show you how we can close this gap. I want to take you back to a typical day in my early childhood to give you a sense of what it was like in the moment. After spending a year in prison, the charges against my mother were dropped. But during that year, she was declared insane by the FBI. When she was released, my grandparents took her in. Well, it wasn't easy having her around the house. She constantly got in fights with my grandparents, wrote crazy emails in all caps, and left nightly voicemails for the FBI. It seemed like the police were constantly at our house. Over the 24 years that we lived there, we racked up about 65 police reports. Amidst this chaos, I was the lowest concern. Which had some perks. I didn't have a bedtime. I could watch TV and play video games for as long as I wanted. But, of course, there were also some downsides. Rather than buy food for me, my mom spent whatever money she made buying more clothes and food for the 16 cats and dogs she owned. To make things worse, I was allergic to those cats and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent most of my time at home sick. School was literally a breath of fresh air. It was only after the bus ride that I could finally breathe and that my runny nose and sneezing went away. Throw in a free lunch and school was pretty much a dream come true. Looking back on it, I can't help but smile because I know how it turned out. But in the moment, it was horrible. Getting anything I needed was a challenge. I knew I wanted to get out, but I didn't know how to, nor did I have the confidence to. Life seemed hopeless. So 
So what happened? Well, I owe a big, I owe a big thanks to my older brother, Sean. He's 18 years older than me. When I was born, he was on his way out of the house and wanted nothing to do with our family. I can't blame him. It wasn't until I was in my early teens that he decided to come back and help out me and the rest of the family. This was my first big inflection point. Sean had started to settle down in Virginia. He was living a good life and had a partner. Just seeing him succeed inspired me. He went through everything I did and more, but he survived and he got out. I thought maybe I could do the same. Sean was also the first person to believe in me, to really believe in me. After my freshman year in high school, he asked me where I wanted to go to college. And I said something like, I, I don't know. Um, I'd like to go to a good school. And being from New Jersey, I said, uh, may, maybe a school like Princeton. But, but they'll never accept someone like me. And even if I got in, I, I, I couldn't afford it. Sean challenged me. He said, what are you talking about? You're, you're doing well in school. If you continue to work hard, you'll have a chance of getting in. And if you get into a school like that, they'll make sure that money isn't an issue. With that little boost in confidence, a switch flipped in my head. And I went from thinking, why bother, to why not? Of course, I was still far from getting into MIT. And when Sean wasn't around, I felt alone and over, overwhelmed by the chaos around me. Fortunately, my hard work started to pay off, and my teachers began to notice. This was my second big inflection point. My junior year in high school, I had an amazing trigonometry teacher, Mrs. Chantel Smith. She noticed that my braces were falling apart and asked what was going on. When I told her that my family kept missing appointments and accumulating cancellation fees, she figured everything out and took me to her children's orthodontist. Her kindness didn't stop there. She paid for me to go to driving school so I could get out of my grandmother's house and away from all of my mother's pets. I was finally able to get a job at the local library and buy food and allergy medicine. When I went to college, she sent me care packages. And when I came home for the holidays, she let me stay with her family. I don't think of her as my trigonometry teacher anymore, but rather my mom. And Chantal is only one of the amazing teachers that helped change my life. Norm Ingram, he taught TV production. I never actually took his class. It was my senior year, and we used his classroom for AP statistics. It was his prep period, so while he was getting ready for the rest of the day, he would observe our class. At the end of the year, he came up to me and told me that he was so impressed by my work ethic and personality that he wanted to make me a promise. He said, I'll make sure you never go hungry while you're at MIT. Norm went above and beyond for a kid that wasn't even his student. He paid for my cell phone and bought me a computer. When I had the opportunity to go to China but couldn't afford the plane ticket, him and his brothers raised the money so I could go. Now, I didn't go to some elite high school. I went to Winslow Township High School, a public high school in New Jersey. We had gun threats, lockdowns, fist fights, food fights. Academically, it was rough too. We were about 200 points below the state average on the SAT. And yet, the teachers there cared and were willing to fight for their students. Thanks to their support, I was the first student from my high school to go to MIT. 
MIT. Despite the initial excitement, when I first got to MIT, I was terrified. Before I left, before I left high school, one of my closest friends told me that the only reason that I got in was that I'm black. Everyone was going to be better prepared and well resourced.、Um, also, I didn't know anyone in Boston, and I was a shy kid, so I was going to be alone. How would I possibly keep up? Well, what I realized was. No one there knew that. This is my third big inflection point. No one knew the shy, quiet Cody from Winslow Township High School. I decided to reinvent myself, to be more outgoing and resourceful. At first, I had no clue what I was doing, so I would start conversations by introducing myself, something like "Hi, I'm Cody," and then struggling through the rest of it. Over time, the conversations became more natural, and I made a good group of friends. I even became the social chair of my fraternity. Academically, I was afraid that I was going to fail, but I used that fear to push me to go to office hours and ask questions. When things started to fall apart with my family back home, I went to counseling at MIT Medical. But by the time that I graduated with my bachelor's degree, I didn't feel behind anymore. I was the president of the Ada Kappa Nu Honor Society, and I had a 4.9 out of 5.0 GPA. It's tempting to think that I'm exceptional or gifted, but I didn't succeed because I'm special. Every accomplishment was a struggle, and I made plenty of mistakes. What enabled me to succeed was the incredible encouragement and support I received. Sean, Chantel, Norm, and many more were invaluable in changing my trajectory and getting me to where I am today. But I want to make one thing clear: that wasn't their original goal. It started small. With a willingness to observe, connect, and engage with the people around them, you don't need to make a big, grand gesture to make a major inflection point in someone's life. It can be as simple as just taking a few extra moments to dig a little deeper, go past that life on paper, and understand the life that someone actually lives. It's only when you understand the difference that you can step in. And make a profound impact by engaging with the people around us. We have the power to close this gap. You just have to ask yourself one question: Why not? Thank you.